preach without Christ. I can't pray without Christ. I can't sustain my marriage without Christ. I can't raise my children without Christ. I can't work at my job without Christ. I can't exercise without Christ. I can't do anything without Christ. So every day I am to live in faith and dependence upon Him for everything. Dear sir, how are you making it through this tough economical time? How do you work on the job that you work on? Your boss is an idiot. How do you put up with him? I live in Christ. Christ is my Lord. Christ satisfies my every need. I have joy. I have contentment. And I have peace because I'm in Christ. I am not finding my joy and deriving my happiness from horizontal circumstances. You fail to understand. I'm living in joy and peace and liberty because I'm living in Christ. It's the sphere in which the Christian lives. If the word sphere is throwing you off, the mountain man lives in the sphere of the mountains. He eats in the mountains, he sleeps in the mountains, he walks in the mountains, he hunts in the mountains. He lives in the sphere of the mountains. Everything he does is in the mountains. The uh, materialistic woman lives in the sphere of the mall. Everything she does is in the mall. If she's not at the mall, she's wanting to go to the mall because her whole life exists at the mall. It's, she's living in the sphere of the mall. The outdoorsman, he lives in the sphere of Cabela's, maybe. And if he's not at Cabela's, he's getting the stuff he bought at Cabela's to go outdoors to do something outdoors with the stuff he bought at Cabela's. That's his sphere. Or as they talk about motocross riders, they say, why do you ride? And they, I mean, their whole life is consumed with the riding. That's all they think about 24 hours a day, seven days a week, is riding a dirt bike. That's the sphere they live in. People do it in all types of things. The Christian lives in the sphere of Christ. My whole world is Christ. My whole life is Christ. What do I talk about in my marriage? Christ. What do I talk about with my children? Christ. What do I talk about to myself when I ride my bicycle or I run? Christ. What, what are my life's decisions? What are my conversations? All of it is in the sphere of Christ because he's my life. That's how I received him. I received him by faith, trusting him for everything and me offering nothing. That's how I was saved. God, here I am. I got nothing but sin. Nothing in my hands do I bring. If you don't have mercy, I'm sunk. It's my life. Take that and live that way until I go home. That every day, every breath, every word, every beat of the heart, every movement of the lung, all of those things are done because Christ is sustaining my life. Without him, it all falls apart. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. So the whole sphere of the Christian life is in Christ. It's a joy, is it not? You, as they say, march to the beat of a different drummer. The devil does not lead your life. The, the devil's not in control. The world's not in control. It's not have you in captivity and bound. You've been set free. You're in Christ. My master's a good master. My master's a fair master. My master's a merciful master. My, my master is everything my soul could ever want and much more. So why should I be downcast on my soul? And I found hope in God. As you received... As you have received him. Think about this. The Christian is offended by lesser things. Do not offer me Prozac. Don't offer me materialism. Do not offer me worldly entertainment. Do not sell me the busyness of the world. All of these are distractions and disruptions to the sphere in which I live. I don't want anything that is going to turn me or take me off of Christ because it's in him that I really live. Everything else is less than and a distractor to that which is real and good. Some verses in regards to as you received. You don't have to turn to them. I just want to read them. Because <coughs> he says here in our text in verse 6, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. In Corinthians he says, I delivered to you of first importance what I also received. Christ died for our sins in accordance with scriptures. This is what I received. This is how I lived. In Galatians, as we have said before and we say again, if anyone preaches to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, 
Well, let him be accursed. I receive the gospel. Anything else, let them be accursed. Galatians again. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it as a revelation from Jesus Christ. I received a message from Christ into my life, and because I did, it affected me, and I lived this way. 1 Thessalonians. We also thank God constantly for this. When you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you did not accept it as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. So now he turns it to the people. When they heard the word and the gospel proclaimed, they didn't receive that word as some man coming up with an invention. They received that word as the very word of God. I received it, and because I have received it, it now affects the way in which I live. And one more, 1 Thessalonians 4. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you're doing, do it more and more. So you receive this. This is the way you walk. Just the same way you received Christ, then walk this way, live this way. You're doing it, do it more and more. The, the very sense of this is we are commanded to live in the sphere of simple faith. Are you with me? Okay, Lydia, pay attention. Put that down, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm going to do an illustration, okay? Okay, are you ready? Did you see her nod her head? She don't have the foggiest clue what we're doing. She don't, because I didn't tell her. I don't, she has no clue. She just can't. Why did she come up here? She loves her daddy, right? She trusts her daddy. And you notice, you put the hand down, she grabs the hand. She didn't ask me any questions. You can go sit down. And she just, she just come right up. That's the way I received Christ. I just love him. And he, he reached out his hand. Let's grab hold. I don't even know where we're going. I don't even know what we're going to do. But if I'm with him, it's all right. It's all that matters as long as I'm with him. And we are supposed to maintain that for the entirety of our Christian lives. Now, with children, I think it's okay. I don't like it, but I think it's okay. But at some point, Samantha stopped holding my hand. Now she's holding Joel's hand. Kids grow up, they become adults. But it's not that way in Christianity. I grab a hold of Christ's hand by faith. I never should grow up in that context. I should never grow up. I want to always remain a submissive, trusting child. Jesus walking this way, I'm walking this way. I don't even know where we're going. But if he's there, it's good enough for me for the rest of my life and then to be gathered unto his presence. That's the way Christianity should look. Why do you do what you do? Because I'm following my Father. I love him, trust him. I know that he would never lead me astray. I know that he always does what is right. He has never spoken with a forked tongue. He has never said yes and meant no or no and meant yes. He's never said up was down and down was up. He's never talked like that. He don't talk like the paper. He don't talk like the guy on TV. He don't talk like anybody I know. His words are yes, faithful, and true all the way. I can trust him. And so he says, run, I run. I don't even know how far I have to run. He says, sit, I sit. He says, pray, I pray. He says, read, I read. He says, go to church, I go to church. I'm just submitting to him whom my soul loves. That's how I started. That's how I'm going to continue. And that's how it's going to be for all of eternity. And oh, what a master, what a savior we have. Now, we come to verse 7. He gives us four things. Four, not to confuse you or get all uh, uh, wound up in grammar, but he gives us four particip participles. The main thing that is going on is in verse 6 that we walk or live in him. Now, here's how this living is going to work itself out in these four participles. There's going to be a, a rooted, there's going to be a built up, there's going to be established, and there's going to be an abounding and thanksgiving. It's going to be four things. 
I just want to point this out. It's important to me. Hopefully it helps you at least a little bit. The first participle rooted is in a different tense than the other three. And I think because of a specific reason. The first one rooted is in the perfect tense. It is in the perfect tense because that is the state or the position or the identity of the believer. I have received Christ just as I have received him. I am rooted. That is the state that I live in. I am a person that is rooted in Christ. And then there's three ongoing activities because I'm rooted in Christ. Because I'm in him and I'm rooted in him, there's three things that will follow of necessity. I'm going to be being built up, I'm going to be being established, and I'm going to be abounding in thanksgiving. Those things are naturally going to come out in my life because I'm smart? No. Because I go to a good church? No. Because I have so much money? No. These things are coming out in my life because I'm rooted. Now, if we could just talk about trees for a moment. Trees are interesting to me because I've very rarely had any in any yard I've ever lived in. But you can take and you can plant you a weeping willow or a global willow in your backyard if the sun comes in your back door and in a couple of years it'll grow up really big and block the sun. It works real fast. They grow fast. And you're like, wow, that's pretty. And I love the shade. What a benefit. The root system on a global willow is pathetic. Hey, roots will come up out of the ground. You'll hit them with the lawnmower deck and you'll bend the lawnmower deck. And you're like, Man, you kick the lawnmower tire. You got to get in there and beat the thing back out. And it's like, and then all of a sudden, after a few years, you get a 20 mile an hour wind and the tree breaks in half. You're like, what a fine deal that is. After all this time of waiting, I finally get some shade, and now my tree broke. And then the next week after it breaks, it's so unstable because its roots are so pathetic that it just dies. You get two ants on the tree, and it's dead. You get the chainsaw out, and you cut it down. Had a lot of good looks and a lot of benefits for a little while. Not any lasting value. Ain't there some people that are religious that way? Put on a good outward show for a time, but a little testing comes along the way, they die, move on. There was no lasting root system. But those who receive Christ rightly, they are rooted. Cut the global willow down, plant you a bur oak. In 280 years, when they get another pastor here, he'll have a nice tree. Okay, I know it's going to take a long time, but at least he'll have a tree. But the roots are what? They're going to go down. They're going to establish themselves very strongly. And multiple years, if the Lord tarries, you're going to get you a tree. And it's going to be solid. So, but as I think about those illustrations, the Christian, not only is it important how the roots grow, but what soil they are in. In front of my house, there's a concrete driveway. And it used to be where you parked the car. But we closed that in and made a living room out of it. So there's no point in having a driveway that goes into your living room. Not good to park your car in the living room. So you break out all the concrete. And you move it on. You make a nice little flower garden. Good idea, right? Everything you plant there dies. Why? Because the soil is mixed with a bunch of lime from the concrete. Plant flowers, oh, it's pretty. Next week, dead. Plant 200 tulips, right down the middle, all dead. Tulips over here, tulips over here, nothing in the middle, soil's bad. Don't invest and plant your root system into that which is no good. Plant your tree in the right soil. In our text, Christ is the soil. Plant yourself in him, live in him, walk in him, be in him, rooted in him, and when the storms of life come, you will remain standing. Because your roots have dug down into that which is an anchor for your soul. You'll never be moved. Build your house on a rock. When the winds and the rain come, you're good. You build your house on sand or put your flowers in line, you're going to die. So invest your life, root yourself in Christ. That's the establishment of who we are. Look, 
You don't know everything there is to know about Christ. I don't even know half of what there is to know about Christ. I understand that. He's far larger than what I ever first imagined. So what am I going to do? I'm going to spend the rest of my life going deeper, digging, pressing away rocks, going as deep as I can to know all I can about Christ because I am convinced that he is everything I need. Don't dig me up and plant me in some other place. Don't move me around. I'll tell you another lesson about trees. This comes from my mama, and she's always making me transplant trees. It wore me out. I wanted to kick my mom a few times until she hit me with a rake and got me straightened out. But she always wanted to transplant. Dig me something, put it over here. It looks good here, Ma. I don't want it here. You dig it up, put it over here. Dig it up, put it over here. It's like, I moved this tree 20 times. Could you figure out where you want it? What happens? It stunts its growth. Stunts its growth. For you dig up a whole tree, move it. Take you one of these oaks out here. This one right out here. And we can get David Melville to bring a backhoe. And you take that thing and you dig that thing up and you move it over here and plant it somewhere else. It's going to be hard on that tree. It's going to be really hard. And a tree that big, let's say you dig up about this wide around that tree and you plant it over here in some good soil. First wind comes along, just falls over. You don't move. You've, you've come to faith in Christ. Don't dig yourself up and go try something else. There's no better soul. As they say, live where you've been planted. You're planted in Christ. Let your roots just continually dig deeper in Him. The best option is not to move. The best option is to dig a bit deeper. Now, building, establishing, and abounding. This idea of building. Let me give you a few verses to bring out this word and how it's so very Christian to who we are. So we've received Christ, we're rooted in Christ, and here's this building up that he's talking about. In Acts, I commend you to God, to the word of his grace, God the word of his grace which is able to build you up. So I'm giving you to God and to his word because you're rooted in Christ. What will build you up? What will strengthen you? What will nourish you? God and his word. Why are we gathered here this morning? Why do we worship? Why do we come to church on a regular basis? Why do we pray? Why do we read the word of God? Because that is life to our souls. You know how it was last year. It didn't rain for 90 days. It was 103 for 50 days in a row, whatever the case was. Everything starts wilting. Trees start losing the leaves. It's the first thing to go in a drought. Sheds its leaves to save itself. All the produce is lost in trying to maintain life when we're not getting the right nutrient. No water falls from the sky. No fruit comes from the end of the tree. Amen? Christianity. I'm not producing any fruit. Are you with God and under the preaching of the Word of God? Because those are the very things that will build you up. I'm not as strong as I need to be. You need more of God. You need more of His Word. That's what's going to build us up. First Peter, you yourselves are like living stones. You're being built up as a spiritual house. Jude, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in the holy faith, praying in the Spirit. And so we're being established and strengthened. Christianity is not a cold, dead religion. It's not some dead thing as a crutch to hold up limping people that don't know how to live life. That's not what Christianity is. Christianity is a genuine, true relationship with the Son of God that we are rooted in, and because we're rooted in Him, we are being built up in Him. Christianity ought to be made up of men and women who are strong in their faith, are established in their purpose, and know why they're actually living. Amen? Do you know why you live? 
Do you know why you're going to get up tomorrow? Do you have purpose? Do you have, if some minor thing comes along, does your life just fall apart? Or do you put one more foot in front of the other and say, I know my God is in the heavens. I know he does what he pleases. I know he's in control. I know this is going to work out for my good because my God loves me. Come on, can we, do we take that position or do we go, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. I guess I'll go down to shortstop and get a lotto ticket and scratch it. And maybe my ship will come in. Really? Christianity's not like that. I'm not going to run to trivial things like that to somehow balance my life out. Christianity is stable and strong because it's rooted in Christ. We're built up in Him. This is a side note. When things happen, when you have a Columbine shooting, when you have hurricanes, when you have tornadoes, when you have a tsunami, when you have these disasters that plague our planet at times, when these events come, when there's a death, when there's a sudden death and someone is suddenly cut off, the lost world responds one way. Christianity that is rooted in Christ and being built up in Him, they respond another way. Right? Right? I'm grieved I lost so-and-so. It breaks my heart that so-and-so died, but my heart's full of joy because I know something. I know I'm in Christ. I know they were in Christ. I know we're rooted in Christ. I'm being built up in Christ, and I know that for eternity I will be with them. I can make it. I can have a sense of joy because I know God raises the dead. So I have a sense of stability in that. The lost world doesn't have that. In the lost world, you lose somebody you love, you just get drunk. Smoke a cigarette, get drunk and gamble a little bit and go sleep with somebody else's wife and maybe you'll feel better tomorrow. I'm just telling you, that's the way the world functions. But Christianity is not so. Christianity says, I know that my God supplies all of my needs according to his riches and glory. And so I don't have to run to anything else. I already have everything I need in him. He establishes us. Not only does he build us up, making us stronger, he establishes, which I think speaks much to a foundation, to make a person firm, committed, established, strengthened in something. In Corinthians, who will sustain you to the end? It is God who establishes us with you in Christ. Uh, this establishing or this foundation that the Lord does in the believer is directly related to this phrase. Look in verse 7. We're rooted, we're built up in Him, and we're established in Him. We're, this being built up, this being established is all in Him, and we do so in this faith, this belief that we have. My foundation, my strength of who I am is because of everything I know in Him. I'm trying the best I can, just connecting everything back to Christ. I am absolutely convinced everything you need for the right rooting, for the right building up, for the right establishing is in Christ. If that's true, I want to know more of Him. I want to understand more of Him. I want to know His Word. I want to walk with Him. I want to die with Him. I want to live with Him. I want to pray with Him. I want to worship with Him. I want everything to be with Him. If He is everything I need, then I want to get all of Him I can get. If He's not, then you must try something else. If he's not, you, you can't, two can't walk together lest they be agreed. Well, I'll take a little of Christ, I'll take a little of this, and say, I'm smart. I'll mix them together, and that way I can get it all. Christ plus nothing equals everything. You, you can't take 50% of Christ and 50% of the world and make yourself stronger. You can only make yourself weaker. It's Christ or nothing. Christ is the satisfaction for my soul. I am not going to look for another. We witnessed last week to a young man, and we witnessed to him, and I said, look, not that this question is going to be asked, but just to draw out the point. If you were to stand before God this night, and he said, why should I let you into my heaven? He says, well, because I did this, and I did, and he went through this list of things that he had done. 
No. And I said, you know what I would say if God asked me that question? I wouldn't say I preached a thousand sermons. I wouldn't say that I was a pastor. I wouldn't say that I was married with four kids. I wouldn't say that I did something good for my neighbor. I would say, Christ is my righteousness, and if Christ can't get me in, I'm not going to enter. He's everything. I'm established in Christ. He's my only hope, and he ought to be yours as well. What we believe makes us more solid or makes us weak. If we believe rightly about Christ, it makes us stronger, it makes us more discerning, it makes us more established, it makes us built up in the things of God. When a man knows what he believes, and he believes it, he'll die for it. You don't have firm convictions. You don't have firm beliefs. I'll tell you what'll happen. You'll be tossed around by every wind of doctrine that comes along. This guy says this. Oh, that's great. Oh, this guy said. Oh, that's good. Oh, this said this. Oh, this book said this. You, 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 you're tossed to and fro. You don't even know which way you're going. But when you're built up in Christ and established in Him, sheep hear His voice. They know Him. They understand. They follow. When he calls, here I come, Lord. He, he comes down and says, here, come up here with me. I'll come. Just like that. That's what we do when we're established and built up in him. Now, lastly, he says, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. To be in abundance. Excel. To go overboard. Uh, as Paul would say in Corinthians, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. But I'm looking at this phrase, abounding in thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for what? That's the kind of questions I ask. Abounding in thanksgiving. Well, if I'm going to excel at thanksgiving, I want to know what I'm supposed to be thankful for. So I look at my text. Main verb, participle, 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 phrase, participle. What's the phrase? As you were taught. I'm going to excel in thanksgiving, and I am thankful for what I've been taught in the Word of God. For the things that God has shown me from his word and my personal readings, from my Sunday school teacher, from my pastor, from just my own personal studies, what I have been taught from God's word, I'm thankful for. I have been taught that Jesus Christ is king. I have been taught that Jesus died for me. I have been taught that he rose from the dead. I have been taught that he would never leave me and never forsake me. I have been taught that he loves his own until the very end. I have been taught that he mediates upon my behalf and he prays for me. I have been taught from the word of God and I'm thankful. All of these things are food for my soul and I don't want to ever grow dull in thanking God for his kindness in what he has taught me in his word, in his church, through the things of the truth have blessed my soul. You know today, God forbid that some grave tragedy or some awkward circumstance would come upon my life, but I am thankful. If it does come, I think I know somewhere to look. Amen? I mean, if I go home today, God forbid, and my house is burnt to the ground, there's nothing there but concrete, I'm not in despair. My life's not over. I'm not going to throw my hands up in there and say, there's no hope, and fall over dead. I'd be grieved to lose some stuff that we like, but I know somewhere to turn. I've been taught something. I know a man in this book, and his name's Job. He lost all his kids. He lost all his family. He lost everything. He said, blessed be the name of the Lord. I know a story in this book about a man named David, and his child died. He prayed and fasted for days, and his child died anyways. He washed himself off, went to the house of worship, and worshiped. I, I've got some kind of resource. I've been taught something. I'm thankful for that. If I didn't have that, I'd be of men most miserable, having nowhere to go and not knowing what to do. Just, oh my goodness, my life's come crashing out. I've lost it all. I'm going to scratch the lotto and play the numbers and hope my ship comes in. And that's all you're left with. I don't know what else to do. I'll go down to the bar. Somebody buy me a beer. Maybe I'll feel better. 
It's either that or I can know what I've been taught in the Word of God and I can be thankful to God that He's been kind to teach me these things and I can benefit from them. As you have received Christ, live in Him. Rooted, built up, established, abounding in thanksgiving for what you have been taught from the Word of God until the end and into glory forevermore. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Lord, help now our unbelief and help us, God, to believe that Christ is sufficient. Help us to trust him by faith with the entirety of our lives. God, may we be rooted even more May we be built up in the things of God. May we be established and firm. And may we abound, excel, and go overboard in giving you thanks for what you have taught us from your word. You're a good God. And we thank you this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name.